All right, hello everyone who uh, is joining today for our lunchtime training on some building assembly uh, options and strategies to comply with the 2020 Vermont Arby's. Um, I'll, I'll give it a minute or so here for people to be able to join. Um, we will, the way the, the Zoom is set up, um, I'll be presenting slides and uh, it's not set up for people to be able to uh, you know, just freely unmute. So if you do have a question, please uh, drop it in the chat or raise your hand. And uh, my colleague, Bryn, will be keeping an eye on those uh, questions and, and hand raising and we'll uh, unmute you if you wanna ask a question. So um, I'll stop throughout the, uh, the content here to give that opportunity. But if something comes up, crosses your mind, throw it into the chat or um, just raise your hand. So that being said, I will, uh, get things started here. All right, so today we're not going to get too deep into the, the full requirements of the code, but really more focus on um, building envelope assembly uh, design and options uh, for compliance with the code. And one thing to note here at the beginning is there is there are references throughout the training here today that are uh, directly copyrighted by the International Code Council. The ICC is the, the owner of the full content um, and language of the code. So uh, we do have permission to share uh, that content in the context of this training today, uh, but they are the, the sole owner of the language from the codes. So just a real brief overview of what Arby's entails. Um, Arby's has been uh, the law for residential uh, construction since 1997. Uh, the code usually occurs uh, or is revised on a three-year cycle where the IECC, which is the International Energy Conservation Code, which is what the Arby's is based upon, um, that changes and is modified on that cycle uh, nationally. So uh, Vermont has tried to follow that pattern as well. The current code was uh, put into effect on September 1st, 2020. So any projects that were beginning uh, construction after September 1st, moving forward until the next code revision occurs, need to comply with the 2020 Arby's. Any projects that were begun prior to September 1st of 2020, uh, we need to meet the 2015 code. So there were some significant changes for 2020, um, new insulation requirements and packages, and that's what we're gonna kind of focus on today. Other options for ventilation, lower door testing, verification of the building envelope air tightness is required. Some uh, language about resistance heat um, electric vehicle charging is starting to come into play as well as solar ready for stretch code and multifamily buildings as well. And one brief thing to touch on at the very beginning here too is the distinction between what is the actual code itself, the ICC published code, and then the Vermont Residential Energy Code Handbook, which is a publication of uh, the uh, Energy Code Assistance Center, which is run by Efficiency Vermont <clears throat> in partnership with the Department of Public Service. Um, so the full code is contained in the ICC document, whereas the code handbook, uh, which is red this year, um, so is you know potpourri of colors, depending on the code cycle as to what color the, the cover of the book's going to be. Uh, but the guidebook is a summary. It's basically the, the cliff notes, um, but more so it's a really good um, compendium of, of uh, applications and content that help uh, um, implement the code. But the full code itself is the document that should always be referenced because that is the actual law. So those documents can be found, the actual full code can be found on the ICC website and through the Department of Public Services site and the handbook will be found at the Department of Public Service site as well. So what's Efficiency Vermont's role with the codes? Well, we're not the code police. We're here as code assistants. We run the Energy Code Assistance Center. So it's a direct line to call if you have questions on the residential or commercial codes. We do training such as this. A lot of our programs that we run are focused around helping people uh, understand and implement the codes. So uh, we are here to support the application of the code, but we do not have any level of oversight or uh, enforcement. There is no uh, enforcement mechanism 
at any state level um, on the codes. It is a self-reporting document and code. So buildings that must comply for RVs, any new construction, single family or two family homes, multifamily that's three stories or less, and existing buildings as well uh, need to comply. That's for additions and any major renovation alteration um, that uh, the work captures aspects that apply to the code. Um, if there is a project that is under the permit process of Act 250, stretch code is required to be met, which is more stringent than base code. There are some exemptions to complying with the full uh, rule of the law and existing buildings, additions, alterations, renovations, repairs, change of occupancy, they have their own definitions and requirements that are uh, covered in chapter five of the code. The teeth of the code is essentially that a homeowner can take civil action against the person who built the building and is certifying it as compliant or not. They can recover costs to bring the building into compliance and any legal fees associated. Claims under the Arby's clause must be filed within six years, but that doesn't mean that a builder is not liable for performance issues with the building after that six year term. It would just be a general lawsuit other than, uh, rather than an RV specific. So uh, the other implication here is that there's more and more lenders, titles attor title attorneys, um, uh, ro brokers, realtors that are uh, looking for code compliance documentation in real estate transactions as well. <laughs> Do you have a quick second for any questions? All right, let's get into the meat of this. Prescriptive compliance for new construction additions. So the code is uh, laid out in five chapters and what we're focusing on mostly today is the content in chapter four and sections R4021 through R404. This covers basically the primary performance requirements for the building envelope and building assemblies in the code. So there's three different ways to comply with the code. One of them is using this prescriptive method and meeting the performance requirements set out in a set of uh, uh, packages in a table. The second way is to use a software modeling tool called ResCheck. And the third option is to hide, hire a third party to do a home energy rating on the uh, home. We're gonna focus on the prescriptive approach today and the prescriptive packages are what these other compliance methods are built upon. So we're gonna go into the details about prescriptive compliance. Uh, if you follow the prescriptive path, it's pretty straightforward. A lot of people end up having that be their default way of complying with the code, even if they're maybe not understanding that's exactly how it's playing out. But it's quite simple. We have five packages, one of them being distinct to log homes, which has its own performance requirement. But essentially what you're looking at here is specific R values and U values uh, and performance metrics for different building components. And you have four packages to comply here. Um, package four here is the only package that is still allowable in the code to just do cavity fill only insulation and above grade walls. Any of the other three packages require some uh, strategy for continuous insulation on the above grade walls. And that's what we're gonna put a lot of uh, the content towards today. Um, but the methodology here is you pick a package and you meet all of the performance requirements in that column to comply with the code. So you can't pick the ceiling value for package one and go with the basement values for package four or vice versa. You have to pick the package and comply with it fully. Along with that, with the new version of the code in 2020, based on the square footage of the house, you need to attain a set number of points based on the size that Points can be attained by enhancing the performance of the building in different areas, and you can choose where you want to attain those points. So you can increase performance in the building envelope to gain points, uh, get the building envelope tighter via air leakage rates and, and get better balanced ventilation into the building, put in more efficient heating and cooling equipment. Water use, renewable energy, and EV ready um, and battery backup are other options as well in the code now too. But you need to meet those base requirements in the package and then choose however many uh, points or understand how many points you need based on the square footage of the house and then pick which options you want to use to attain those points. So as we're putting the building together, you know, what are our options? What ways do we go about this to get efficient and durable building envelope assemblies? So, Pretty basic needs we, we are defining with a building envelope. 
trying to protect the humans living in it and make a little uh, happy, healthy microclimate. Control air flows, heat loss and gain, moisture, get good indoor air quality. That's more of utmost importance these days. And we have different control layers to impact those needs for the house. Um, there's, these are the things that we need to be paying attention to when putting a building assembly together. You know, the assembly is an assembly. It's an assemblage of parts, it's an assemblage of components. So we need to look at what each uh, aspect of each component of that assembly is going to accomplish. So we're looking at controlling bulk water getting into the building from the exterior, drainage plane, whether it's just a barrier is another name for that. The thermal control layer, which is essentially trying to temper the indoor air from the outdoor, keeping it cool or warm, depending on the season. That's your insulation layer. Your air control layer is basically what's keeping outdoor air or indoor air from interacting with each other from the building envelope. So that's your air barrier, essentially. And then vapor control. We generate a lot of moisture in, in, in breathing and living, just humans off gas a lot, as well as generate a lot of um, moisture vapor in the uh, inside their buildings and in the winter months it's it's a very contained environment so we need to manage that moisture and keep it from getting into the building assemblies so these are our vapor barriers or vapor retarders so looking this at this as a cross section what we're looking at here this purple line is your exterior cladding your primary layer to keep water bulk water from the exterior getting to the assembly behind it then we have your water resistive barrier, your WRB, which is intended to keep uh, any water that does get through out of the sheathing and the wall assembly behind it while still hopefully allowing that wall to breathe. Air barrier is where you're trying to control any interaction of outdoor air and indoor air from occurring, keeping you know, the building envelope as tight as possible. We have our insulation layers. Those can be cavity only, or they can be a combination of exterior and cavity. And then you have a vapor retarder, which is inboard of all of this, the very inside of the assembly, which is what you're using to manage moisture vapor from getting into these assemblies. So this all works together. It's a system. You're putting an assembly together to make it a system. So you can't insulate unless you air seal. You have to insulate the building. So, and if you're going to air seal, you need to have ventilation. And we're not talking about ventilating building assemblies here. We're talking about mechanical ventilation to manage the indoor air quality and moisture levels, relative humidity inside the building, because we're making as tight of a building envelope as possible. And moisture is the, uh, the, the root of all evil here. We wanna keep water, moisture of any type out of the building assemblies from the outside and from the inside. Moisture is huge, must be managed. Um, it's the, it has the biggest impact on building durability, on indoor air quality, uh, high humidity levels inside a building. It, it creates the conditions for mold and mildew to grow. It actually makes pollutants in the house and BOCs and other things like that <clears throat> more um, uh, uh, impactful. It will actually enhance the, uh, uh, the damages caused by those other pollutants in the house. So it's really important that we try to keep moisture in check as best as possible in the building and then manage what moisture does occur and keep it out of the building assemblies. The amount of moisture that's contained in a building from when it is built is extremely high. Uh, concrete itself takes years to stabilize from a, a moisture level, a moisture content level. Um, there's a lot of water that goes into making of concrete and you pull it in a full, full foundation underneath the house, you're gonna have a lot of embodied moisture there that is going to evaporate out of that material and needs somewhere to go. So um, all of these things, all of these different layers that we're talking about here are your strategies, your options, your ways of, of keeping that from damaging the building assembly. And then again, trying to manage what moisture does exist in the building through appropriate mechanical ventilation. So there's different ways. Uh, actually, I'll give it a second for any questions. Any questions? All right. There are different mechanisms for moisture to be transported through a building. So you have bulk water movement, which is essentially exterior driven rain or water runoff coming off of the building that can get into a building assembly. You have the water vapor in the air that is generated from breathing, from the combustion of fuels, from cooking, from showering, 
from living, essentially, living in the building and conditioning it. Uh, capillarity is where you actually have water being wicked through materials, where you have uh, wet going to dry and capillary action moving that moisture with it. It's, creates a level of suction um, to some extent. So this is an, a, a, an action where you have a um, moisture permeable material in contact with a wet or damp surface. And then you have vapor diffusion, which is just the, uh, the movement of, of vapor, water not existing in its liquid form, but in its vapor form, um, passing through or being absorbed into materials. So that is a slower mechanism, but it's a mechanism that uh, accumulates over time and throughout the heating season. So bulk water management is very often and very easily overlooked in many building assemblies. So intersecting roof planes can destroy wall assemblies quickly and easily. Simple things such as kick out flashing to prevent that water from getting into the siding um, and going against the building itself. Uh, are easy solutions to this, but it's also attention to detail. Um, you know, the code is written as a design document where hopefully it's being used at design stage where you're thinking about these issues and these matters from a design standpoint so that problematic details can be avoided to begin with. Um, but those details need to be attended to and managed out in the field as best as possible as well. And it's simple things like this that are often routinely done that can create long-term damage. Um, and that long-term doesn't take very long with modern building materials. OSB can be damaged like this in a matter of years rather than decades. So let's talk about condensation because condensation is the, the primary concern in the winter months uh, when we're talking about the interaction of moisture and building assemblies. So warm air carries more water than cold air. And we have warm air in buildings in the winter. So you know, we can carry more uh, moisture in that air as we're trying to stay comfortable during the heating season. And dew point is the uh, condition where temperature of a surface um, or uh, a temperature in the air um, reaches a point where moisture no longer is sustained as a vapor. It actually transforms into a liquid at that point that's condensation. So if you have materials that are below what the dew point temperature, that material surface is gonna be cool enough that that moisture vapor will go from vapor to liquid form and collect in that, spe in that spot. And that's what we need to avoid because those are the conditions that can occur inside walls, inside roofs and basements and places that we can't see and we can't touch until it's too late or until something very, prob very problematic has occurred. So we can, design assemblies to prevent that from happening as much as possible and be resilient, but we can also control those conditions as best as possible inside the building. So there's times when condensation can be good. And there's times where condensation can be bad. And this is one of those places that we can see a lot of condensation in Vermont homes, even in new construction. And then sometimes it can get really bad in those situations uh, with windows and, and condensation. But condensation just doesn't, doesn't just occur on glass. It's the most um, observant. It's the most right there in your face in a home. But moisture over time and these condensing surfaces can destroy buildings. And then you're left with uh, an extremely expensive and invasive need to repair something that should have been resilient for decades rather than for years. So the damage potential is real. These are consequences right here of inadequate air barriers, inadequate vapor control, mismatched materials and assemblies, and completely unmanaged indoor uh, air quality and relative humidity. So it's relatively straightforward to manage moisture in building assemblies, keep the water out as much as possible. If water is going to get into those assemblies um, as a vapor, which inevitably it will to some extent in, um, our building assemblies here in Vermont in the winter. Uh, you know, we're trying to slow and mitigate that moisture migration into building assemblies as much as possible, but we also basically need to allow a valve in there at some point, okay? So if, if moisture does and will eventually get into a building assembly, it needs some mechanism for it to dry. And then third, if moisture is going to get to a surface in the building, then that surface should always, try to be above the dew point so condensation can occur. And that's what's problematic about modern windows is some of the glazing options to get to the uh, U values that are required now 
create colder indoor glass surfaces, interior glass surfaces than before. And if you're not managing relative humidity, that cool glass surface can be the first surface that reaches dew point and condensation occurs. So it's a management of expectations and, um, and air quality and, and vapor in the building um, to prevent that from happening. So when we're talking about vapor control layers in building envelopes, the vapor control is your primary membrane mechanism, material, whatever it is that you're choosing to use to try to prevent the movement of moisture into a building assembly. And vapor control layers, we're talking about permeability ratings, perm ratings for uh, different materials. There are class one, class two, and class three vapor retarders, as well as vapor open materials. So there are requirements in the code for vapor retarders. Class one or vapor two, class one or two vapor retarders, boy, that's really, tongue twister at the moment. Class one or class two vapor retarders are required on interior sides of all framed walls, but via Arby's, except for when we're talking about against a concrete wall, basement wall, below grade walls. Um, and we'll talk about where your options lay in class one versus class two, what the differences are, what the material options are. So we'll get into that in the upcoming slides. And then class three vapor retarders, um, which are much more vapor open material um, are allowed and sometimes encouraged for specific building types. And this is where we're getting into higher performing building envelope uh, assemblies of upgrade wall assemblies with continuous insulation. So that's why we'll talk more about this today. Um, you know, what can we do as we start to get higher R values in wall assemblies? Where does that put, put potential dew points within those assemblies? Um, how do we manage the uh, flow of moisture into them and how, where can we let it out? Um, if and when it does occur. So, you know, what you're looking at in cross section of a wall where we have <clears throat> a 70 degree indoor air temperature and it's zero degrees outside, there's a gradient of temperature within that two by six, let's call it wall assembly. At some point in that wall, as heat energy is moving into that wall, and to some extent, hopefully not much, air is moving into that wall through leaks and gaps because warm air inside the building, cold air outside the building creates a significant pressure difference in the winter time. So air is just pushing into those assemblies. And when that occurs, you're gonna see some gradient of drop off in the air temperature and in that assembly temperature um, as that occurs. So what we wanna to try to avoid is creating a cool enough surface somewhere in this assembly where any moisture vapor that's in the wall or in the air that's getting into that wall will hit a cold enough surface at the right temperature to condense and turn into liquid vapor at that or liquid water at that point or frost more often in the winter time. So, you know, that oftentimes is the backside of the exterior sheathing. Sometimes it can occur closer into the inboard side of the wall, depending on the relative humidity and the air temperatures and how leaky that assembly is. But this is the dynamic that we're looking at here, this range of temperature gradient within a wall assembly and trying to keep this condensation um, surface potential for a condensing surface to occur. Any questions? All right. So we'll talk about some uh, materials, how they react to moisture, what's good, what's not, you know, some considerations as you're, again, putting these building assemblies together, assemblies of multiple components. Each of those components can have different characteristics. So what are our options? Sheathing. Um, sheathing on a building um, can be quite impactful of the ability of a wall assembly to have the capacity to dry, um, for it to, to breathe, and for its durability. Um, OSB, common building material obviously now, and the common building material that we've seen the most damage with over time um, for inappropriately specified components in building assemblies. Um, OSB used to be cheap because nothing's cheap anymore, but OSB had been the go-to because it is um, relatively uh, cheap as a building material compared to, to plywood, or at least it's less expensive than CDX. Um, but it is much more susceptible and um, uh, prone to moisture uh, damage and um, impacts in general. 
Uh, so, you know, it, it can be used to create an effective air barrier when we're taping seams and, and sealing it up as a full unified layer. Um, OSB can be quite airtight, um, but you do have to be managing and understanding its risk and potential for moisture damage. Uh, plywood CDX, the old school way of sheathing a building, if you want to call it that, um, has a higher vapor uh, permeability rating than OSB in general, and it can be more tolerant to moisture loading over time. Uh, you know, CDX plywood is shaved down trees, it's peeled trees. So you still have the same cellular structure to the wood that allowed that tree to be able to manage moving moisture and water and sap through its, through its cellular structure over time. So it does give it a little bit more resilience uh, than OSB does. OSB is compressed bark mulch essentially. And when it gets wet, it goes back to its happy place, which is bark mulch. And last thing you want to be sheathing your house with is bark mulch. So not to say OSB isn't a good sheathing material. Obviously, it's very commonly used, but it needs to be detailed and protected right. So how do we prevent that condensing surface against sheathing? Um, ideally, we want to try to keep that sheathing warm. And when we start to talk about code moving in the direction of continuous insulation wall assemblies, that's what we're looking at doing is, is putting insulation outboard of the sheathing most of the time um, to improve the thermal performance of the building envelope. And also when it's specified correctly in the right um, ratios and amounts of continuous insulation are put outside of the sheathing, it'll make the sheathing warm. It'll keep it warm enough so that it won't get below the dew point uh, throughout the heating season and the potential for damage will be uh, negated or at least significantly minimized. So adding continuous insulation outboard of a sheathed wall can be one of the best ways to keep it warm and dry as long as you're putting the right amount of insulation outboard of the building. And when you are specifying the insulation that you're putting outside of that wall sheathing, um, you want to understand, understand the uh, vapor characteristics of that material as well and how that's going to interact with the other materials in the assembly. Because the last thing we want to create is the vapor barrier sandwich, um, which is essentially where you're putting a uh, class one vapor barrier material or something that has a perm rating that would classify it as a class one vapor barrier on the exterior of a wall assembly. And then also having that same type of class one vapor retarder on the interior of the wall assembly as your vapor control layer. So this is kind of the um, you know, classic deal where you have a two by six wall fiberglass in it. Someone puts an inch of polyiso foil face foam board in the outside of that wall. And then there's a six mil poly vapor barrier on the inside layer of that wall behind the drywall. <clears throat> in that case, you've created a wall assembly that if moisture gets into that cavity where the fiberglass is, it's not gonna be able to dry effectively to the outside because the foil face polyiso is a vapor barrier. And it's not gonna be able to dry to the inside because the poly is a vapor barrier. So it's a very risky building assembly. And hopefully that assembly was built with CDX because that would tolerate it better. If it's OSB, it can be damaged quickly. So these are the things that we wanna be mindful of again, as specifying the right materials and the right connections and the right ratios. Um, Vented cladding, rain screens is another big thing that has become common practice and, and hopefully will be just considered common practice moving forward, where with a rain screen is essentially what you're doing is you're, you're uh, disconnecting the exterior cladding or the siding from being in direct contact with the wall surface behind it. So when you're doing that, any water that's driven through the siding and gets behind the siding will have an air gap between it and the wall that you're trying to keep dry and cozy and safe and it won't suck into that wall assembly whereas if you have cladding that will get wet from exterior conditions and have that directly in contact with the wrb and or the plywood or sheathing whatever that is behind it that can get wet and stay wet over time so that air gap between is a pathway for bulk water to shed and it's also a pathway for moisture vapor from within the wall assembly to dry out and not just absorb and wick capillarity into the uh, siding cladding material um, that's put on the outside. So um, common, it should be common practice these days, but it's another step in the construction process. It's another consideration about how to do your exterior trim and details, but um, whenever possible, that should be the, that should be the outcome um, being aimed for when it comes to uh, siding a building. <clears throat> 
Any questions? All right. We do have one question, Steve. Oh, sure. Um, inner air is a polyzo without the foil face. What is what is its permit uh, permit rating? Polyiso without the foil facing on it. Correct. Okay. Uh, typically, it's under one or around one. Um, sometimes it can be a little over one. So <clears throat> it would be considered a class two vapor um, permeance, typically, when it falls in that range. As soon as you put the foil facing on, though, um, you know that's where it becomes a vapor barrier. Uh, many of the polyiso manufacturers do a perforated type of um, polyiso foil facing that does allow for, again, it to be fall into that class two category. Um, but you can also get polyiso with paper facing and other facings on it. So it, in those circumstances, without the foil, it would be a class two. That's it so far. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bryn. So let's talk about vapor retarders here for a moment. Um, these gentlemen are putting up uh, what you typically understand as six mil poly, the old way of doing vapor retarders in an assembly. But if you look more closely, it has a certainty print on it. So keep that in the back of your mind. We'll touch on that again in a minute. But primarily what I wanted to illustrate here is that the vapor retarder most oftentimes is a membrane <clears throat> applied to the interior surface of the wall before interior finishes go up. So doesn't always have to be a membrane. It can be drywall, it can be other materials, but commonly it is. So here are those different ratings. Class one would be a vapor barrier. So common materials are, as we just talked about, sheet polyethylene, six mil poly, or um, aluminum foil. Class two vapor retarders are XPS, as I, you know, which has a, a similar uh, permeance, permeance rating as the, the polyisos without the foil facing. Uh, and the craft facing on fiberglass is also considered a class two uh, vapor retarder. And then class three vapor retarders are getting above one perm. You're getting one perm to 10 perms essentially, or, or greater. So most latex paints are considered a class three vapor retarder, 15 and 30 pound um, roofing felt is a vapor retarder. And plywood usually has a perm rating of two-ish or maybe a little bit higher. So it's considered a class three vapor retarder as well. Then we have vapor perm or vapor permeable uh, materials. And Tom Hanks as well to join us today. So these are, they're called different things. So I'm gonna use different labels for them. Um, so as you come across them, you can know what we're talking about here. So intelligent vapor retarders, vapor variable uh, retarders. So these are membranes that permeance varies based on the humidity level inside the building. So when you have lower humidity in the uh, winter months, the uh, lower it's lower permeability. So you're actually mitigating the moisture flow into that assembly um, with these materials. In the winter months, it slows that vapor drive into the cavity and is quite effective at keeping moisture vapor out. And then in the summer months, the warmer months, because those conditions exist and the warm side of the building envelope is to the outside now and higher humidity on that side, it actually opens up the, the membrane itself is more vapor open and has more ability for vapor drive to occur inboard to the house during the summer months. So essentially it's slows vapor movement into the assembly during the winter months when we want it to be slowed or stopped if possible. And then in the summer months, it opens up as a valve essentially and allows for drying to the interior of the building. So these are materials that are um, recommended and suggested when you start to do continuous insulation on the outside of the building, because you'll have lesser of an ability for drying potential outboard um, most of the time when you do uh, continuous insulation unless you're using a, a very vapor open um, continuous insulation material. So if you are doing that, typically using one of these vapor variable membranes on the inside will give you an insurance mechanism essentially in the summer for vapor diffusion to occur into the building and for the assembly to dry. So 
Uh, certainty makes this membrane material, which is what that first slide showed. Um, Proclima, which is a European company and distributed here in the US, uh, makes the, a couple different products, um, Tello and Proclima being a couple, of, or DB plus being a couple of them. Um, these are, you know, have different performance ratings. So the Proclima and the Intello Plus are probably the most common from this, uh, from that company. And we do see used a lot in higher performance building envelope assemblies around the state. So anywhere from to up to five and a half perms to 12 perms for the Intello Plus. Craft paper, again, um, on fiberglass can be quite effective as a, as a vapor of a variables type of uh, material. And the certainty membrane uh, in their uh, literature offers up to a 10 perm rating. So we are seeing more and more of this because it's, it's less expensive uh, than these other options other than craft paper um, and commonly acceptable for most installers. They're used to using six mil poly. So this doesn't look, feel, box like a duck, quacks like a duck sort of thing, works similarly. Any of these things though, any of these membranes really, unless you're detailing them effectively are gonna be useless. If you just slap up a bunch of this product on the wall without paying attention to sealing up the joints and taping it or, or, or gluing it at window rough openings and door rough openings and bottom plates, top plates, et cetera, um, it's not gonna fully do what it's meant to do. You know, you wanna create a, a uniform plane of material in order for it to uh, uh, perform its intended purpose. So any other questions on intelligent vapor permeable, vapor retarders, or any other um, vapor retarders before we jump into air leakage? Okay. So air leakage and airtight building envelopes. Um, we want not this, we want this. We want buildings that have very few, if any, air leakage pathways through the exterior shell. So it's gonna happen, you know, these are, this is physics we're working against here and physics always wins. So pressure differentials create suction, they create um, a potential for air to move through building assemblies. You know, wind pressures by wind blowing on one side of the building creates a positive pressure and a negative pressure on the opposite side. Temperature differentials creates pressure differences. Um, which moves air and, and forces air into building assemblies. <clears throat> and then exhaust fans, building, you know, range hoods, dryers, uh, bath fans, those create negative pressure within buildings as well. Combustion appliances, those can draw air through the building envelope. So um, we want to prevent that as much as possible, both for the fact that air leakage through the building envelope is the primary driver for heat loss and energy consumption and comfort. Um, but also it creates the potential for the mixing of indoor air, which inevitably has moisture in it, into building assemblies where inevitably or hopefully but not, but most of the time they'll find cold surfaces for that moisture to condense against. So the impact of this is real. This is a kind of a classic image um, that comes from uh, Building Science Corps Builder's Guide for Cold Climates book. <clears throat> so this shows the amount of moisture that can migrate into a building assembly, let's call it a wall here, throughout a heating season when there's a hole in that wall. So a typical sheet of drywall is going to be pretty effective at keeping moisture from getting through it and into the wall behind it. So an unbroken sheet of drywall through diffu diffusion in an average house, you're going to get about a third a quart of water through that 32 square feet over the course of a heating season. Whereas if there's a one square inch hole in that sheet of drywall, that'll move 30 quarts of water to that wall assembly during the heating season. That's not insignificant. And that amount of water vapor getting into an assembly can uh, wreak havoc. It could bring us those images I showed you earlier on of uh, completely destroyed uh, wall sheathing. So this is real and this is why we wanna be doing as best as we can in the detailing of the envelope to keep that from happening. So, you know, as I mentioned here, all these things are affected by building an airtight building envelope. So an airtight enclosure includes the whole thing. You gotta be able to define where you're trying to keep 
the air from interacting uh, where your air barrier is, you know, being able to look at the at an elevation or cross section of a uh, building plan, you should be able to define in an unbroken way, a continuous line around the a building assembly that defines for you, this is where we're going to keep air from getting into and out of the building envelope. So it can be a lot of different things, roof, ceilings, walls, windows, doors, all of these components and where they intersect are pathways for air leakage to occur. And preventing that air leakage is not just a one size fits all or a one material fits all approach either. Um, it's an assemblage of different materials. It can be membranes, it can be plywood, it can be drywall, it can be windows, it's stores. It's, it's a variety of things put together as an assembly to create an effective air barrier. So continuity is the primary thing here, you know, a continuous barrier that is detailed appropriately as you transition from one material, one building plane, one building assembly type to another. You want continuity and you want air impermeability. You want to make sure whatever that material is, is going to keep air from moving through it. And durability is not, needs to be accounted for here. That's where we, you know, using materials that will last in that assembly and last over time. And obviously, uh, or maybe not so obviously, the simpler the building design and type, the much simpler it is to attain these goals and to the cost of getting to that end result. So the less complicated the building design, the easier it is to define the air barrier and get the appropriate materials to put it all together. So you're not limited in any significant way as to how you go about this and what materials can be used. These can be spray applied membranes, it can be typical WRB or, or vapor retarder membranes or other assemblies of those types. Spray foam, rigid foam are considered uh, air barriers depending on the material and its application. Uh, plywood, OSB, drywall, concrete, you know, these are all air barriers and they're all typical parts of different components of a building envelope. So they all work in concert together to create that end effect. Typically not effective air barriers, uh, using plastic sheeting, you know, and trying to think that uh, six mil poly is gonna serve as, a, as a, an effective air barrier. And house wrap as well. Um, house wrap can be detailed as an air barrier, but oftentimes it's, it's limited in its ability to do that and could be problematic. Um, but again, it's all back to details and understanding what the purpose is that you're installing the material for and who's installing it. You know, if you're accept accepting that house wrap and the WRB is going, going to be your air barrier for the building, and that's what you've planned on, then the person who's installing that WRB better darn well know that's the intention as well, and they better know what it takes to detail it effectively so that it'll for, you know, serve that purpose in the building. So historically, there's been two different approaches to take to doing this, either an exterior air barrier where you're using Typically, the exterior sheathing, the plywood, the OSB tape sealed and detailed to be an effective air barrier. Or as I just mentioned, you can do the WRB if that's detailed appropriately. Or airtight drywall, where you're relying on <clears throat> the details of the drywall going up to create an air barrier from any air getting into the um, assembly behind it. This is a much straighter line on the exterior air barrier approach than the interior air barrier approach, which has all these little jogs and details and you're relying on many different subs and trades to get you to that outcome. You can choose your adventure though. But material manufacturers have uh, caught wind of, of what's needed and, and developed products that and uh, processes that make this a little more ingrained in the construction process. Uh, the ZIP system and other um, manufacturers like them who've integrated WRBs into their exterior sheathing products. Um, that's been the primary purpose for these materials is to dry in the building as quick as possible. But the fact that you have to tape all the seams of all of that plywood or OSB to get the WRB effective has really made a huge impact on air tightness and building envelope assemblies. You can see, you know, this is a blower door uh, reading from a house at minus 50 pascals, which is the typical pressure test, um, past depressurization for testing a building for air leakage and really, really low CFM numbers. So taped sheathing on an exterior building assembly as a defined air barrier, whether it's the zip system or if this is CDX or if this is OSB or if this is rigid foam, uh, 
those tape seams appropriately detailed go a huge, huge long way towards getting an airtight building envelope. Aero Barrier is another product that's uh, come to market here in Vermont over the past few years. This is a vaporized um, aerosol material that is actually applied to a building under pressure. So actually they use fans like blower door fans to pressurize a building and then use this aerosol um, uh, pookie goo spray that is aerosoled into the building. And as the building is under pressure, it's basically pushing that pookie into any little hole or crack that would exist in the uh, building envelope and sealing it up. So this can be done during uh, new construction where you're sealing the exterior sheathing. It can be done in existing buildings as well. It's not a one-all fits all approach to getting an effective air barrier, but it is a, um, uh, a material process that's come to play, which we've been seeing some pretty um, interesting results from. Any questions? All right. Last little section here, uh, primarily just some examples from the field um, pictures and, and, and assembly types and, and options for putting them together, putting all these pieces together, the air barrier, the vapor retarder, the insulation materials to get different um, assembly types. So starting with the slab, vapor barriers underneath concrete slabs just should need to be getting done. Uh, and this is a good example of how they should be appropriately detailed taped seams of all the field joints, taped around any penetrations for plumbing vents or, or anything else that would come up through. You'd be amazed actually how much air can be sucked through uh, a typical slab with no vapor barrier um, underneath it during a blower door test. Um, it actually can be significant depending on the soil types um, that where the house is built. So um, it's real and it's really hard to fix after the fact if this isn't put into place um, under a slab to begin with. And then how would you do with that vapor barrier under the slab to try to unify that in that, like I said, if you do a cross section of the building, you should be able to have a continuous line around all six sides of the building envelope that unify your air barrier and your other control layers. So when the slab was poured, that vapor barrier that was underneath the slab was lapped down over the edge of the foundation, just kind of temporarily set there in place so that when it was finished and the wall was built on top, you can bring the vapor barrier up, tape it to the exterior face of the, the zip sheathing. The zip sheathing here is the primary air and vapor control layer uh, or bulk vapor control layer here on this building assembly. So that's how you'd integrate that intersection. So the intersection of building components um, are where most of these tricky details lie. And when if they're drawn into the plans at the beginning, <clears throat> much easier than to try to troubleshoot it and figure it out in the field. So always things that should be and could be thought about uh, before a hole is dug and construction goes underway. So again, just different approaches that can be taken here. This is a spray applied um, vapor barrier and membrane and, and WRB on the outside of a building envelope in place of a, a, a fabric or a rolled membrane. Again, taped sheathing zip system, or, you know, doing your air barrier, your air, air sealing details on the inside. Now this is showing all these caulked joints at plywood to, to studs and stud to stud, stud to plate, plate to floor. I'm going to give my honest opinion here. I wouldn't rely on this because that caulk will do its job when the house is built. But over time, as the building moves and shifts and dries and seasonally uh, changes, that caulk's going to rip right open and your air barrier that was quite good if, when it was when it was completed it would probably not be all that great again at that point so using resilient materials and resiliency here means materials that will last and serve their purpose over time and not degrade or uh, shift in functionality over time so above grade walls this is just showing the placement of the primary air barrier plane where it was defined in this assembly. So on the outside sheathing plane, a continuous insulation, um, some type of above that, 
Again, going to the exterior as your primary air barrier saves you the hassle of trying to accommodate all these other details that exist structurally inside the building envelope. But as you do that, you do have to be paying attention to building transitions, roof planes, intersecting building you know, sections, other things like that. It's always easiest to be doing this on a piece of paper or a plan set ahead of trying to figure out these details in the field. So again, just making sure you have continuity all the way up through as you have these sorts of building assembly transitions where you have penetrations through the building envelope. Again, trying to specify materials that will be durable and resilient over time. There's quite a few options for these sorts of little patches available on the market now where they adhere to um, the uh, material behind it, have a gasket or some sort of taped assembly to a pen, uh, um, an intentional or required penetration. Window and door openings as well, making sure that the, the weather stripping and sealing and flashing and everything that is required for the windows is integrated into the air barrier and other control layers of the wall assemblies. Wall openings, um, you know, choosing to use foams versus tapes to seal up gaps and caulks. Um, taping window units to the framing. Uh, is a great way to really get a really effective and durable, um, and resilient air seal at those intersections and those intentional openings. Foaming between the window unit and the rough opening is required just from an insulation standpoint. And sometimes it can be effective for making that an airtight gap as well. But oftentimes it doesn't hurt to tape that also. There's a lot of different air sealing and um, uh, you know, air sealing tapes on the market these days. Uh, that are quite flexible and can be very effective for accomplishing a lot of tricky uh, air sealing details in a building assembly. When you transition from an exterior air barrier on a wall assembly to an open flat attic plane, transitioning from the outside to the inside can be kind of tricky. So that can be done with, they're showing spray foam here as a way to connect what's going to be the primary air barrier, which is the ceiling drywall in this uh, building to the exterior air barrier, which is the exterior sheathing. So that's an air impermeable material that's bridging that gap. Conversely, and I'll show you a slide here in a second, you can continue membranes here as long as you're doing that as part of the framing process. But air sealing at the attic and a simple wide open, open attic assembly where you're gonna blow in a bunch of cellulose or fiberglass, um, whatever you put in for your thermal layer at the top. Drywall is a really effective, um, air barrier for the top of that building, but making sure that any of the interior wall plates, any of the wiring penetrations, light fixtures, you name it, that would penetrate that drywall, those all need to be sealed up effectively before any insulation is, install is installed. Conversely, you can use plywood, you can use OSB as a continuous air barrier at the ceiling plane, and then just drywall directly against that and not have to worry about any of those um, other partitions or, or penetrations to seal up. So that's an alternative option. Using a vapor variable membrane, uh, the Intello here as an air barrier at the, uh, at the ceiling plane, air and vapor um, barrier in this circumstance before drywall goes up, that can be effective as well. So there's many different ways to approach it. And this goes back to what I mentioned just a minute ago, when you're looking at you know, transitioning from one building assembly to the next, and you've got to have continuity for a control layer, do you need to do some aspect of that in a different stage of the construction process? You know, this showing here, what this is showing is this Intello is being used as an interior vapor control layer and probably an air barrier as well inside this uh, scissor truss roof assembly. Well, in order to have continuity of that barrier, that Intello needed to go up before this top plate was installed and these interior partition studs were installed. So parts to be considered up during the construction process, because otherwise, if you were just trying to butt to this plate, it wouldn't be that resilient. It wouldn't be the best assembly. So, you know, thinking ahead in the uh, framing process and getting all of the subs and trades woven into that process as well uh, is important. Any questions before I go through the last few slides here? Okay. Last few slides here, essentially just um, showing some physical examples of some of the um, 
continuous insulation wall uh, assemblies that would be considered code compliant. Um, and these are some details that are available in the RBC handbook I mentioned at the beginning as well. So getting to really high R value, high performing wall assemblies, continuous wall, uh, wall assemblies. The Arctic truss or TGI or Larson truss wall is essentially where you're, you're building an interior structural wall and sheathing it and then doing the majority of your insulation outboard of that structural wall and creating trusses using floor trusses as a way to build a cavity to fill with insulation, typically filled with cellulose in these circumstances. But these are some examples of how that would work. So wall framed, sheathed with a zip system here, and that's your air barrier. And then TGIs attached vertically to the exterior of that. <clears throat> Tyvek put up as the WRB. In this circumstance, strapping for your cladding and the rain screen, and then dense pack cellulose behind it. This is showing here that under appropriate installation conditions, cellulose installed at the right density will stay in that wall assembly, even by taking off the, uh, the membrane that it was encapsulating it when it was filled. So it's an option, pretty involved option, but uh, we have seen it done a lot. So definitely happening out there in the field. Double stud walls are another option commonly used and historically been used and can be very effective. Um, essentially, you're building two walls and you can gap those two walls from each other as, as wide as you want to get the R value you're aiming for. Um, air barrier can be defined in different planes and different ways when doing this type of assembly. Um, so you are left with options as to how that can work. Exterior rigid insulation. So this is framing a standard two by wall, two by four, two by six, uh, and then adding exterior rigid insulation of any type really to the uh, desired R value that you want to achieve. But what you want to be aiming for in these sorts of exterior rigid assemblies is if you have an R23 Rockwell bat going into this cavity here, in order to keep the plywood or the OSB from being at risk of being condensing surface during the heating season, you'd be wanting to put approximately R12 or R11 and a half of continuous insulation outboard of that sheathing. So 50% of that cavity R value, you'd want to get to that continuous rigid sheathing insulation. Um, that would af effectively keep the plywood or OSB closer to the indoor air temperature and not condensing surface during the heating season. Nail base panels, uh, more options for these coming onto market, um, which is where you have the exterior sheathing uh, adhered to a layer of rigid foam board behind it. So this can be one inch of rigid foam board, it can be two inches, it can be three inches of rigid foam board, it can be structural, it cannot be structural, but it's a way of getting the actual sheathing still to the outboard of the building to ease the exterior finish and trim and also taking what would be the concerning condensing surface which is the osb and putting it to the outside of the building envelope in this situation moisture that would get into this wall assembly won't come in contact with that osb and put it at risk of condensation or damage so this is why that can be a resilient assembly as well uh, and then SIPs, structural insulated panels, where you have a foam core with OSB typically laminated to either side of it in different thicknesses and R values for those types of assemblies. And then just finally, at-risk assemblies where you know, you're not getting that 50% R value ratio in the continuous insulation and you have sheathing in between, that can be a risky assembly. Um, Nail-based panels where you're doing the adhered foam board to the OSB and then putting a, po a poly vapor barrier, a six mil poly on the inboard of that. Either of these circumstances where you have the potential of an air barrier or condensing surface in the outside and then a vapor one, class one vapor retarder in the inside is, would be considered a risky assembly. So that's pretty much it. Who's got your back here to help you out on this? If you've got questions, problems, want to work through things? We always have Bill Murray, thank God, or thank whomever. But we also have us, the Energy Code Assistance Center. So again, there's that toll-free number you can reach out to uh, at any time with RBs or CBs questions. Uh, the Vermont Public, 
Department of Public Service as well. And also feel free to reach out to me uh, directly if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help you out. So thank you for taking the time today. I will stick around here for a bit um, for questions. So um, if you have questions, then throw a hand up, pop in the Q&A. I'll start taking a look here. Let's see, we have one question. Um, why does the OSB of the nail base panel not see condensation if the insulation is not a class one vapor retarder? So you could still see condensation in nail base panels if you're using a thin nail base panel and you're not managing your vapor control on the interior well. Um, the, so the potential can still there exist there for a condensing surface in the wall, but that foam board is not going to be susceptible to damage like OSB would. So with the OSB being outboard of the foam, it's never going to see the, the moisture that would come to it. It would be hitting that foam board first. But ultimately, what you really want to be aiming for there is a thick enough nail-based panel where that won't occur. But in managing moisture vapor um, as much as possible from the inside and keeping it from getting into that assembly. And that's why I, I mentioned in there that we always recommend or it should always be recommended that you're using a smart vapor um, membrane as a vapor retarder in those sorts of assemblies so drying can occur inboard. Great, thank you. We have another question. Will the recording of your presentation be available later if we want to share with others? Uh, yes, we will have that available on our energy code support web page. And I will drop a quick link into the chat so that is available for everyone. Um, but even without the link, if you're just watching the recording, you can go to our website and look for the four trade partners up in the top right hand corner. And then as you scroll down under tools and resources, you'll see energy code support. So we'll have it posted there. All right, All right. I think well, those are the questions we have for now. All right, well, thank you everybody. Appreciate and you joining here today. Great, we'll post the um, code support call numbers in the in the chat here as well steve if you have that available you might get to it before i can i actually found it It's not working. <laughs> That's right. I got it. Got Great. It. All right, thank you all you. for attending today. Thank you, Steve. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks.